this is Doug, and we will be teaching the newcomers class today. So what we're going to talk about is what, what makes gardening here different from wherever we may have learned to garden. The premise of the class in some ways is that most of us probably learned to garden somewhere else. And you move here, and things are different in a number of ways. So we're going to discuss all those, discuss the weather, from lots of show and tell, plants to talk about that do well here, products to show you, and we're going to also talk about best practices uh, in the garden that we all have around here. So, uh, Michelle, do you want to start? Um, let's get started on uh, seasonality. Um, the seasonality here, um, our last frost date is usually around Mother's Day, which is pretty typical for kind of the mid mountain west range. Um, last spring, our, we had a frost on right before Memorial Day. So um, it was a strange, cold, wet winter. Um, our frost date, first frost date, in, is usually around Halloween as far as where you're going to have to lose all your petunias and your vinca and all that fun stuff that we enjoyed all summer. Um, so that being said, we have a lot of different, uh, we have a very long span that we can garden, uh, plant evergreens, uh, trees and shrubs, everything that we can do here. There's a lot of different, uh, there's no bad time to plant. Um, you want to tell them about the weather and how? Sure. Well, one example of what Michelle's talking about. You think that's bad? Wait till the planes start flying yeah. over. <laughs> well, the planes that never read all. Well, if we're lucky, we'll have a, a fire engine taking off. They're right over there. <laughs> the, uh, it, it's true that there are these kind of ups and downs and weather, a, a little bit of unpredictability. And um, one of the challenges for growing is that we have major differences, temperature differences, uh, that is from daytime to nighttime. So, you know, early spring, late spring, we can have beautiful mild days in the 50s and 60s and sunny, and then it can go down to maybe 30 at night. Uh, this spring, I had been uh, working on my irises and, you know, they weren't quite ready. I went away on a trip for a couple weeks, came home, they were flowering, they looked beautiful. This was like late April and then around mid-May we had a hailstorm. And it just sort of parked over my neighborhood and just shredded all those beautiful flowers that I had divided them and fertilized them and I thought, okay, well, wait till next year. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, some other plants that were hit by the hail didn't seem to mind. I did a little bit of cleanup and they and they looked fine. So there can be ups and downs, just like we Michelle talked about Mother's Day. Uh, Mother's Day is the planting date uh, for vegetables. But as you know, many of us gardeners are kind of impatient. And if the weather's nice, we want to plant those tomatoes. And so we'll see people coming back every couple of weeks. More tomatoes, more tomatoes. <laughs> well, how many do you have? Well, I'm, I'm actually replanting, you know, because because the weather did me in, or whatever it is. But, so we're talking about seasons? Right, yeah. Seasons, right. So many of us may have lived somewhere else, California, where there really isn't as much of a season now. But here, we definitely have four seasons. The thing is that there's no transition. It just goes from one season quickly into the other. Instead of kind of drifting in, kind of really. So, I mean, like now we're definitely in the fall. And, um, my wife's going away for a couple of weeks. When she comes back, I bet it will be in winter. It will feel that way because it will be really much colder. Right now. But the, uh, the winter season, there, there's still planting that you can do, uh, pansies, mums. Uh, and now in the fall, there's some nice cool weather vegetables, leafy vegetables. That uh, We've got some this red leaf romaine. I, I watered mine this morning, it's looking really good. I'm gonna start picking the leaves and I can make a salad and it has a good taste. It's not bitter, it's not kale. Um, and so <laughs> we have to be uh, aware that 
We do have these seasons, and uh, be patient that some plants uh, that, that just won't do much until it really gets hot. So we have flowering perennials uh, like crepe myrtle, which are beautiful, and we have a perennial version of lantana. And I usually go out there in May, and I look at my plants, both of these, and, and I sort of, I talk to them, I say, okay, look, the weather's nice and warm. What are you waiting for? You, you have all your leaves there, we're waiting for flowers. They're, what they're waiting for is hot weather, consistent hot weather. And so, rather than pull that plant out, which I've been kind of tempted to do because you think it's not alive any longer, give it a little time, be patient. So, kind of, sometimes we can have a late spring, um, then we go directly into sort of a hot, dry June, which is a tough time of year for plants in general because it's very windy, it's a persistent, uh, prevailing southwesterly wind. It is dry, it is hot, and that's the time of year where you may want to give some additional water to your plants. If you're on a drip system, but you see that they're drying out, getting a bit dehydrated, a little bit of additional water uh, can often help. And then beginning of July, if things go according to schedule, all of a sudden, monsoons come and the plants really come alive because this is what they've been waiting for. We can water our plants every day, but we can't give them humidity. And when the monsoons come in, we do get some humidity. And we have a, a nice, long, warm summer growing season, fall season now, where we can talk about some of the plants that do well. And then in winter, for the most part, it's, uh, it's, it's hibernation for a lot of the plants. Pansies will flower all winter and they can survive hailstorms, snowstorms. The only thing that didn't survive in my yard was javelinas dig. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's another subject we'll talk about later on. But so you have to think in terms of, of the seasons and be aware that it doesn't ever seem to be much of a transition from one season to another. It's a little bit abrupt. So as far as the veggie and garden, vegetable garden seasons, um, we have two cool season uh, areas where we can actually plant crops. So usually March-ish, we'll start getting the lettuce, the kale, the peas, um, beets, all that stuff that you can plant for that March to June time frame. Uh, usually once June pops in, it's so hot that all that stuff is going to start bolting and, and going away. And that's when you're your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your squash, are all your tropicals are ready to go into your garden. Um, tomatoes, cucumbers, they like soil temperatures above 50. So uh, we wait um, until Mother's Day. Usually by that time, where temperatures are in the 75s and 80s, um, where we're pretty comfortable about putting them up there. If you're one of those impatient ones, there there are ways of going around it. Uh, but don't put them out too early because they can get stunted and then we wonder why they're not doing anything, you know, towards the end of May, early June. Um, so cold weather will do that. Um, the summer season goes, I mean, uh, somebody was telling me they've got tomatoes out the yin yang. My tomatoes didn't do much this year. Um, but it goes all the way through. Uh, we've got the cool season crops back in and we're, those will be good through probably December. Once we get a really hard, hard frost, pretty much everything just kind of stops growing. So you, you have what you have and, and you're pretty much done with that. Um, as far as regular planting, um, you really have no, there is really no bad time to plant. Um, even in the dead of winter, we don't frost or we don't, you know, the soil doesn't freeze, so we, we can still dig holes or you can still plant. Um, it's just a little bit of fine-tuning as far as uh, taking care of those newly planted uh, trees and shrubs that we, we put in. Um, winter is a good time to kind of take a look around your garden, kind of look for holes and start planning for your springtime planting. Um, there's a lot of cleanup and stuff we do in the fall and or winter and early spring. Uh, most of our pruning we do at that point. Uh, fruit trees and regular trees, we shrubs, 
we all prune in the springtime, usually February. Um, grass seed, wildflowers, uh, February is a great time. Um, if you are looking at planting a new lawn, now's the time to get in. And one thing about winter pruning, winter and spring pruning, is uh, if you have any roses, and by the way, roses do really well here, we usually prune those in March. Um, and if you, depending on the size and the age of your roses, you can do the major pruning. You've probably been doing deadheading and some pruning in the course of the summer as time goes by, that's okay. But usually in, in March, the roses will benefit from a major pruning, which means you get down to about maybe six, eight, ten canes, and they're about you know knee to waist high, and you cut out anything that's old, diseased, crossing, anything that you don't like the way it looks. Uh, the roses here do not need to be mulched over the winter time. Uh, mine held on to their leaves till uh, maybe sometime early December, so they look pretty good. But by by the time March comes around, you may see some new growth. So you don't want to cut them in the fall the way we may have done somewhere else because you don't want, you can encourage some new growth and then most likely there'll be some cold weather. So I, if you want to talk with me about pruning roses uh, in March, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. I went with the Master Gardeners and we pruned all the roses in uh, Charlotte Hall grounds. If you've ever been there, they have about 200 roses. and so. We were there on a kind of chilly March morning, and we had 10 people cut, and six people hauled everything away. Thank goodness we weren't stumbling over the canes. And uh, it looked, uh, I, w I drove by there a while back, and the roses look pretty good. I don't think they look as good as mine, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> they have 200 there, I just have three. You're not biased, are you? No, I'm not biased or anything. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the, Pruning in the fall and the winter, as Michelle said, a clean up. Uh, if you've got deciduous trees, uh, like I do, you've got a lot of leaves to pick up. It's just probably spend more time in the fall and the winter uh, doing that kind of work. And once the leaves have dropped, you have a better idea of what the branches look like, if they need to be pruned. We have classes on tree pruning taught by uh, an arborist. You can look those up at anything, any subject imaginable related to gardening on YouTube videos. Those are always available as, as a resource. Um, one of, I don't know if any of you have tried to dig a hole in this area. Um, there are a few things that I would purchase for your garage if you like to do it yourself. Um, a pick is one or a digging bar, pry bar, or something like that uh, to loosen the rocks and get you a good start. Um, if you don't feel like doing it, we do provide planting <laughs> services to make it easier for you. Um, when you are planting a tree or shrub, um, basically we recommend that you dig your hole uh, twice or three times as wide as the bucket that it's in. Um, and just as deep, you don't want to go any deeper than what it is sitting in the ground. Um, there we go. So this guy is like this. So if the green bucket was your ground, you're going to just set it so it's just like that. If you're going to err one way or the other, you rather go up than down. If you plant in a hole, you're going to get root rot and your plant's going to die. Um, so that's not a good thing. Um, we also recommend two-thirds natural soil to one-third of our premium mulch. Um, when we say premium mulch, it's actually a compost. Um, we, uh, Ken has made this uh, product for this area, so it has a, a helps drainage, it gives you organic matter, helps break up the clay. It, if you have a really porous soil, it will um, give you the water something to hold on to so you get that retaining moisture. Um, we recommend that you fertilize when you plant um, with our all-purpose fertilizer. Um, we did come out with a new fertilizer this year. Um, 
for fruit and vegetables, um, which has a calcium ingredient. It's more of the old-fashioned bone meal uh, mixture opposed to the all-purpose that is more of the sulfur uh, and nitrogen and phosphate. Um, it, the fruit and vegetable has all those also, but we added the calcium in it to help for um, the blossom end rot, all, all those black spots on the bottom of your tomatoes, that, that's a calcium deficiency. Um, and then squash kind of just starts coming out and then it just kind of shrivels up at the end. That's blossom end rot on squash. Um, I didn't realize squash did that until I moved here. Um, so calcium is a, 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 a necessary agreement, a ingredient for vegetables. Um, so we do fertilize when we plant. Uh, we also use root and grow. And while we're on this root and grow subject, this is a new formula for us. Um, we uh, Ken actually tested this for a year before we brought it on the market. Um, you will notice uh, that the numbers have changed. Um, it's a 2 2 1. Um, the other one had a lot higher numbers. Um, this is a slow, re in, slow release, or it, there's a lot of micronutrients in this to help the, the hair roots get going. Uh, it helps um, bring the, the mycorrhizae, which is a good fungus, to your plants. Uh, mycorrhizae also in, in gets earthworms and stuff like that to your plants which help aerate the soil and, and it, it makes your soil better. <coughs> um, watering. Uh, watering here is pretty simple really. Um, we recommend when you newly planted trees and shrubs get watered twice a week depending on the size of the bucket that it's in. No more than that. Um, so any of those landscapers that tell you you need to water every day, don't listen to them. You're, you're, all you're doing is wasting water. Um, one inch of water only penetrates the ground four inches. Um, so know your sprinkler system. It's, it's one of those things we harp on a lot. Um, if anybody listened to Ken's radio show a couple weeks ago, he actually got on a soapbox and it was kind of short <laughs> with this subject. Um, so know your system, know how much your emitters are putting out, because um, that's going to help you in the long run, um, to know how much water you're actually putting on your plant. So longer watering periods so it goes deeper will give you a, a stronger, healthier root system in this long-term effect. Um, if you're watering 15 minutes a day, you're just basically watering that top four, I mean, probably that top four inches. It's not going down. So what's going on with your roots if, if you're only watering 15 minutes a day? So it's something to think about. Um, most emitters do have that 0.50 on them or 5.0. So you, you, you can tell how many, um, how much, how many gallons are coming out of it. Uh, so know your system, learn it, kind of figure out how it works. Um, if you can't find any numbers on it, get a five gallon bucket and let it run for an hour and you'll figure it out that way. Yeah, ideally, for this plant that we were looking at earlier, say you put this in the ground, this one gallon plant, there's a rule of thumb that Maybe you give it one gallon twice a week, one gallon of water, or you make sure that it goes all the way down to where the roots are and a little below. And so, so how do you test that? Well, one thing you can do is you can put a probe in the ground that can be, you know, a screwdriver, a piece of rebar, or over at the property or extension, they have these probes with a handle, you can just put it in there. If you put the, your probe into the ground and it's been watered properly, it should sink into the soil easily if you if it stops and you hit a hard spot, then chances are you haven't watered uh, enough. So it's difficult to say you know, how much is enough because it's different for every yard. If you do, you know, every yard, well, you know, the soil, let's talk about soil again. In general, if you have soil in your yard, you're fortunate. <laughs> Some of us have just mostly rock. That's kind of my yard. Other people have clay. Uh, in Prescott Valley, my sister-in-law, Granville, has clay. 
she asked me why her plants aren't doing well. I pull them out of the ground, and they're dripping what? They look like a wet sponge. Some people have uh, decomposed granite that drains very quickly. So to say, well, this tree needs X number of minutes, two, two or three times a week, it's, it's sort of a moving target. But general rules, you know, one gallon per uh, pot size is something you can follow. Or there's the one, two, three rule, you know, one gallon for flowers, two for shrubs, three for trees. These are all kind of general guidelines. You have to learn what's working in your yard to determine how much and how much. And then if you plant a tree, let's say a spruce tree, don't let anybody convince you, as Michelle said, that it should be watered every day. Um, last summer, a customer came in and he was very unhappy that his spruce tree didn't look good, it was turning brown. He told me, even though he watered it every day for five minutes. So we had this whole conversation that we just had now. And when he left, I think he was a little disturbed, but he believed what I told him. And evergreens around here can easily be overwatered. So when we talk about watering, more often than not, the problem is too much water rather than not enough. So that's something that we want to be very cautious about. Right. Um. So that kind of finishes up the actual how to plant here. Um, there is also a maintenance piece that, that you kind of have to pay attention to here. Um, we're all gardeners. Go out in your garden daily, every other day. Pay attention to it. Um, thrips, aphids, spider mites can come through and do some hefty damage if you don't pay attention to your yard. Um, I, I had a, a customer uh, not too long ago that went on vacation for a week. Everything was nice. And he came back and his uh, Alberta spruce was completely brown on one side. And so I said, bring me a twig. We've got this lovely microscope down at the bottom and we, we do diagnosis and all that stuff. Um, we found spider mites on it. And, and they came in that one week that he was gone, and it took out the whole side of his tree. Um, if we could catch it early, we can. A lot of this stuff can be pre prevented. Um, grasshoppers can annihilate a whole bed in a matter of days. So really pay attention to your your trees and shrubs. Uh, take a look under your leaves because um, that's usually where your insects are going to hide. Um, most people think, oh, it's a dry area. You shouldn't have fungal issues. You shouldn't have insect issues. We have a lot here. Um, and it just depends on the year. So I, I always suggest that you have an arsenal. And I'm sitting in front of the arsenal. Um, water's multi-purpose is our insect spray. Uh, this will take care of 100 different insects uh, in your yard. Um, from aphids to thrips to even grasshoppers. It is a contact killer. Um, so most of the insects that you're hitting are going to die. Um, it also leaves uh, the per permethrin. Yeah, the permethrin that's in it um, uh, leaves a residue on your plants. So anything else that's chewing on it will die after they ingest it. Um, the other thing that's in the arsenal is a fungicide um, because powdery mildew, um, uh, shot hole, fungal, uh, fungus, um, rust uh, sometimes we get, fire blight, any of those things can be taken care of with this. And if you have them in your garage, I mean, it's so much easier to have something ready um, and prepared. It, it just, it's kind of like your kitchen with your spices. You'll, you always have something on, on in your cabinets. Um, <coughs> real quick, um, this sprayer is amazing. Um, it is pricey, it's, I think it's $39.99, um, but it's the last sprayer you'll have to use, uh, purchase because the, the way it's made. Um, the really nice thing about this is you put your product in here and it mixes in this part here. Um, so anything remaining in here, you pour right back into the bottle. So you don't have to throw that away or figure out what you're going to do with that. Um, 
the biggest thing is just to make sure you clean it afterwards. The, another thing about spraying, sometimes you know we have trees, shrubs that are too tall to spray. I had thrips in my pear tree. I tried to spray them uh, in the trees, and basically with the wind and the height, I was getting more uh, spray than the tree. And as far as I know, I didn't have any thrips. The tree had the thrips. But back to this revitalize. This is a great fungal product, antifungal biofungicide, and it also helps to boost the immune system of whatever you're applying it to. It says here that it'll make up to 96 gallons. This is a concentrate. So I've used this a lot. I just mix it and you can do a soil drench. That's a little bit better than on days when there's a lot of wind. You just pour it on the ground and you mix it according to the formula. Uh, and it, it goes a long way. So that's another thing. You know, these, these activities that we want to take off and to work in the garden, we want to make it simple. Pouring this into a bucket, pour it in the mixture, pour it on the ground, and I'm done. You don't have to, you know, do math in the garage about how many ounces per gallon of water, etc. So let's talk about some of the pretty stuff. Um, a lot of newcomers uh, that come in, it's like it's so brown, it's so ugly. Um, we're very water wise here, which is why a lot of us have rock and we decorate with boulders and such. Um, because if you have a lawn and you actually water that lawn, you're going to have an $1,800 water bill. Um, so it kind of, if you want a green lawn, okay, but you're not going to pay for it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can mix and match your your trees and shrubs so you have winter color winter interest but you also get the spectacular leaves and flower colors um, so you have to have this really good mix of evergreens and deciduous plants um, so really think about that when you're planning your yard or when you're updating an area uh, bring in a mix because Evergreens, most of them do not flower. You just get the green. So it's always nice to have butterfly bushes or the autumn sages to, to add that color throughout this, the year. Um, the way this nursery works is we bring things in when it's blooming. Um, so in the springtime, you get your uh, columbines, your delphiniums, all that stuff that blooms in the springtime, the iberius, uh, your candy tuff. Um, April-ish, we start bringing in the peonies, so we get that, you know, beautiful flowers. Um, summertime, crepe myrtles, the butterfly bushes, um, hibiscus, Rosa Sharon. Uh, so everything is seasonality. Um, back to spring, I forgot the Persephone and the lilacs come in in the springtime. So anytime you see something blooming, it's probably too late to buy it unless it's, or, or that's when you want to come in here because that's when we're going to have it. Um, fall color, the bottom blaze maple is, kind of, is fixing to turn gorgeous color right now. Um, the red wall winter creeper, which is a Virginia creeper right behind Doug, uh, is spectacular right now. Um, and it's a great vine that can be a ground cover, it can be uh, a vine up the, the side of a fence, you can use it for privacy. It is a deciduous plant, so it does leave, lose its leaves, so you're going to have this wooden, basically wooden fence um, when it goes dormant, but uh, you can't beat that color. I was up in Flagstaff for a couple of days, and the autumn blaze maples and these creepers are just a little bit ahead of us, uh, ours here. So there was some beautiful color right there. But one of the things, I feel this plant behind me, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's rubbing me because it wants to be mentioned here. <laughs> and this is the Russian sage. So once this starts flowering like this, uh, in the springtime, maybe in April or May, it'll flower like this all summer long. You don't have to do much of anything. After a rain, it kind of releases the sage smell. They can get a little bit big. They do require pruning. Uh, but they're really hardy plants. I, uh, after a couple of years, you don't even need to water them any longer. 
So I have a bunch of them, and where I could find the emitters, I just shut them off. Uh, some plants are so big, I couldn't find the emitters. I got tired of getting, just sticking my hand in there and getting stabbed. So I said, okay. So some have water, get water, others don't, and they're doing equally well. One thing about this regular Russian sage, and it's sort of a small version and a smaller one, is the large one can try and take over. So you want to give it plenty of space. Smaller ones are maybe two by two, but whatever size you get, this is a good plant. You'll see it all over the place. It does well. And um, animals don't like it, so we haven't talked about animals, but yeah. should we try sure, and Sure, absolutely. So Michelle talked about insects. One of the not so pleasant surprises here is to, that gardeners get, you can step out to your yard in the morning and everything is gone. Or the nice flowers, roses that you planted, they're gone. We have a lot of animals around here. It can be deer, javelina, squirrels, pack rats, uh, gophers. We have whole classes on how to deal with those. But one of the ways to deal with them is to select plants that they're less likely to eat. So anything that's herbal, like this, anything that has a strong herbal taste or smell, they're going to stay away from. So my yard has a lot of Russian sage and autumn sage because my yard happens to be like an ancient passageway for javelina clams. And when I say clam, I'm not kidding. There'll be eight of them at a time, and I hear them maybe lumbering through. Uh, sometimes they do damage just by stumbling into things or they dig things up to determine that they don't like them but they have they can do damage as a result but if you if you focus on plants that they don't like they're likely to go and let them go to your neighbors you know, figure out what's there I mean in a lot of ways you know you know we can't get rid of these animals they're here with us so you have to plant and think in terms of you know what they're going to like and maybe what they don't like and you know, they also, when it's going to be really dry, they can dig up irrigation lines because they're thirsty, they're looking for water. Uh, my, my neighbors have a wonderful bird feeder. I call it the javelina feeder, actually, because the javelina just come, you know, bang the pole, and it rains down bird seed, and they come in there, and that's sort of their order, and then they hop up to my yard for the good stuff. Uh, luckily, they haven't touched my roses, so I feel grateful for that. But um, definitely animals in the... You know, we talk about all these insects and animals and this and that and frost. It don't mean to say that everything is doom and gloom. This is a wonderful area to garden. Thank you. And, uh, and so it's really, uh, you just have to learn, you have to learn the ropes. You know, say, learn how to deal with it. Know that you may have some setbacks weather-wise, animals. We can't do too much about the animals. We have to learn to work around them. Uh, and so. You know, because we have such a mild climate, we have things that do really well. This autumn sage, you'll see them that I mentioned around town. These are fast-growing trees, wonderful shade trees, well adapted to our climate. Um, most everything up here uh, is going to do well in our climate, and that's how we select plants here. We don't bring in avocado trees or eucalyptus or citrus because we know they're not going to do well. So anything that's here has we has a history with us, so we know we what kind of conditions they require. And that's, uh, so that's important. So don't understand that there may be some setbacks, but learn how to deal with them, I think is the outlook of uh, gardening. So my red leaf lettuce is growing up in a big pot on my deck, second story enclosed deck. Havelina <laughs> hasn't figured out how to get up there again, but I, I, I think they're trying. But, uh, <laughs> um, we're passing around this, uh, sign-up sheet, email sheet. Um, basically, we don't hand this information out. We just will forward this recording to you so you can watch it over if you miss something. Um, we will also add the um, deer and javelina lists, the, the resistant list. Um, and there should be a disclaimer on these. This is a resistant list. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but um, it just kind of depends your area and how desperate they are. Yes? Could you touch yeah. on um, what time to spray insecticides so that we're not going after things like, you know, we're not going to hurt the butterflies and we're not going to hurt the bees? That's a great point. Um, he just mentioned to the, the proper times to uh, spray insecticides. 
Um, so basically, anytime you go out to spray, whether it's an herbicide or an insecticide, you want to do it when the wind's not blowing. So very, very early in the morning is a great time, especially if you can catch it right before the sun comes, or where it's kind of twilight, um, because the bees are not out there at that point. Um, and you can spray without damaging them. Um, because the spray is a contact killer, if you hit a bee with the spray, it, they will die. Um, so you kind of have to just take, in effect, you know, if, if you've got a lot of damage, when you're going to do it and how you're going to do it. So make sure you do that right. Yes, ma'am. So we have a new temper. We live in um, Animal Hill. And we have a huge number of rabbits. And I was wondering, um, do they eat, they don't eat the sage, the, 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 the Russian sage? Uh, her question was, is do rabbits eat Russian sage? And to my knowledge, they don't. Um, they I'm pretty much, violas and can. They will love those violas and can. Yeah. Um, In general, anything that's a beautiful flower, a wonderful meal for a rabbit, deer, a javelina, whatever it might be. But you know, I had a lot of marigolds coming out, and they were about that high, and I went out, and they, all the leaves were just eaten off. So. Yeah. And that's when the disclaimer, because marigolds are on our resistant list, and the rabbits love them. Yeah. That's one of the problems. And they're not supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> and we, they, you know, we have difficulty getting animals to read these lists, and they hear it's kind of difficult when you know we'll, we'll read off a couple plants. How about this and this? And folks will say, "Well, I had one of those, and somebody ate them." So it doesn't always work. It's the idea is that they're less likely to eat one of these. So, but as far as the sage and the we were talking about the herbal plants, there's autumn sage in addition to the Russian sage. There's rosemary. There's lavender. Um, any of the herbs that we have down oregano, below, oregano. Like I had a whole bed of basil and uh, they don't like, heavily didn't like that. They discovered a pepper plant in the middle and they ate that they left the basil alone. So if you can plant herbal, uh, you, you have a better chance. Of one more um, question. Um, I got some snapdragons that I bought here and they were doing really, really good. Okay. Um, do they receive themselves? Her question was, do snapdragons receive themselves? And usually they will. Um, now, when, when winter comes, do I need to cut it right down? The, the nice thing about snapdragons and pansies are that they can handle our cold. Uh, usually you'll stop seeing flowers as much. Yeah, no, I have no more flowers. Um, so just trim them down, leave the, the shrubby part, and they'll regrow. So don't, don't cut them right down? The no, no, don't re cut them down the ground. Um, and they'll, they'll just keep going and going and going. Um, those are one that the pack rats tend to go out and just snip off. They don't eat them, they just snip them off. <laughs> um, just a little bit about um, diversity in your yard. Um, when you are looking at signs on your our plants, all these tags are made for across the country. So uh, some of them will say full sun, and it's a hydrangea. If you plant a hydrangea in the full sun here, it's going to cry. Um, so if you are unsure, please talk to us. Um, we will make sure that we get you the right plant for the right area. Um, we also set up, we have a shade, a shade section uh, for perennials up front. Uh, the shade perennials or shrubs are on the side underneath that black hanging right out front by the bad goods. So we try to put them in select locations so it makes it easier for you guys to find. Um, everything that's out kind of in the middle obviously can handle the full sun. But if you have questions, that's what we're here for, so please ask. We, we do know our stuff. Um, Speaking of the camellias, back to the soil issue. Camellias are plants that, in addition to one, they want to live in the shade, they also want an acidic soil. We don't have acidic soil around here. Our soil is very alkaline. So there are some people who grow their hydrangeas 
geraniums or dendrons, whatever it might be, gardenias, they grow them in pots because they, it's easier to control the acidity of the soil. But if you do plant this in the ground in your yard, you can add soil sulfur, you can add mulch, fertilizer. You, you want to be sure that you're keeping an acidic environment because on the pH scale, we're high in alkaline. So that's why we don't put, add Epsom salts to our soil. It already has plenty of salt. So some of these plants uh, require amendments a few times a year to get the acid level back up. You want to, plants want to be in a balanced area as far as the pH scale. And you will notice that we do preach on fertilization a lot. Um, for all deciduous plants, for, uh, you should be fertilizing three times a year here. Uh, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, and for your evergreens, you're going to add New Year's for that. Um, with our all-purpose fertilizer, it's a 744. Um, it, it, it's a slow release. It's uh, uh, pet and kid friendly. Um, that being said, um, when you go to store it, put it up, put it on a shelf. Uh, if you leave this bag somewhere where your dog can get it, they do tend to eat it. Um, so, it, and it, if they eat enough of it, it will hurt them. So, be cautious with it. They're not going to dig up your plants to get to it, but because you water it in. Um, but just the caution on that. Uh, what do you have to do to winterize them? So the question is about. Uh, winterizing drip systems and I think for the most part they need to be shut off for the winter time maybe in November I mean if you watch the weather if it's going to get down to below freezing for several nights probably better to do it before that I usually maybe shut mine down maybe around Thanksgiving kind of depends on the weather so the drip system should be off for the winter but Back to watering. <laughs> we sometimes have warm, mild, dry winters. And if that's the case, you still want to get out there and water maybe once or twice a month. Larger trees and shrubs. I do that with a hose. I don't feel like starting the system up and then having to drain it and you know cover it up and all that kind of stuff. I just figure I don't need to spend some time. Maybe the day when I'm putting down the fertilizer, I'll be out there with the hose. And it may take me about an hour to water everything. But if we have, the you know, last winter obviously was not a mild winter. We have plenty of moisture, a lot of snow. That's a little bit unusual. Um, but if we don't have any precipitation for about a month, you should be out there with a hose watering, deep watering, especially the trees. So they can, they can, su they can suffer if they're neglected from the watering point of view. But that's my recommendation. Turn the system off, hose. You don't have to. Yeah. So the question is about freezing. Uh, is it get cold enough so the hose hose doesn't have to go inside? You do want to you know, un take it off from the bin because you don't want any freezing going on in there. So take the hose off, let it drain. I usually keep mine maybe in the garage, and I, that way I know that I've removed it yeah. from the bin and I don't have to worry about it freezing. And, you know, having something going inside and end up freezing. Also, if you are considering planting this time of year, when that winter watering that I just mentioned is very, very important. Um, even though it, if it's a deciduous tree like your maple, once all the leaves go out, it pretty much stops doing anything. It stops growing. It's, it's not going to put out any roots, so it's just going to sit there. Uh, but you don't want that root system to dry out. So every two weeks, you'll definitely go out and, and water that new tree and shrub uh, uh, really well so it goes all the way to the bottom. You want to keep those new root systems moist. Um, we have a couple of hydrangeas that are in gray planters. I understand they lose their leaves during the winter. Is that correct? Yes. So will I continue feeding them? <laughs> so the question is about hydrangeas, and uh, yes, they are deciduous; they lose their leaves, and a winter feeding would be would be a good idea. Yes. So and also, uh, hydrangea is an acid-loving plant, so maybe a little uh, soil sulfur would be good. 
but soil sulfur. Sulfur will help to acidify the soil and environment that they live in. The, the fertilizing schedule for this whole purpose that we talk about is usually about three times a year. It can be four, but uh, the, the dates that we recommend are like Easter. You have to fertilize on Easter, everybody knows that, <laughs> right? And then 4th of July, because fertilizing is a patriotic thing to do, right? And then Halloween keeps all the goblins away and so on. And then maybe once in the wintertime if you want to. That just helps. It's a general rule of thumb that helps us to remember when to do that, the three or four times a year. So you just go out there with this, sprinkle it on the ground. We have a 20 pound bag as well. And uh, I just kind of toss it on the ground, water it down. Don't have to till it into the ground. Just make sure it's, it's wet so that it starts to break down because it's very light and fluffy. It can blow away. But I would include uh, this in your schedule for the winter for the hydrangeas because what you're doing, because this is a slow release product, is you're feeding for the springtime bloom that's going to be around the corner and so on. Well, I bought a product that was uh, particularly for hydrangeas um, that I used when I first planted it. Mm -hmm. Is that good enough or should I also do that? No, I wouldn't double fertilize. Okay. Yeah. Is that good for roses? Uh, it's got roses in white girls. Yes, this, this fertilizer he's asking about what is it's good for everything in your yard. That's one of the things I like about it, because I can put 20 pounds in the bucket and walk around and fertilize everything. And I've done the season. I don't worry too much about something for my roses, something over here for my vegetables. It's just one fertilizer, the whole yard, water it down. I'm good for another three months as far as fertilizer. Um, we built our house 30 years ago. We put in a sycamore and it's pretty, it's a very mature tree. We also put in a flowering plum. Now as far as fertilizing, do we still need to do that in the winter? Um, okay, so her question is about trees in general, uh, fertilizing. Is it necessary to do? Uh, oh, for a really for the, mature trees. They're immature, right? I mean, they're not. No, no they're very mature. It, and even mature trees are going to benefit from some fertilizing, and so it, you, you can't do any harm. It's going to help them. Uh, some people think, okay, just leave them alone, don't water them, because walk out to the national forest and ponder as the kinds are doing okay on their own. But this is our yard, basically, and we want them to be full and rich. Uh, these, I have a couple of these out of blaze. They're huge now. They're they're kind of in their glory. They're 11 years old. They're really in the prime of life. Fertilizing helps keep them healthy and grow. So, yeah. And that, that's really important because once your plants and trees get stressed, that's when all those issues start coming. Um, the bugs and insects can uh, sense a tree. That, that's kind of what happens with the ponderosa pines and the beetle kill. They see a stressed plant or tree, and that's when they go in. Um, a fully saturated tree um, that's has that moisture in it, they can't get in. Um, but it's when we went through the drought, that, that's when they started boring in, and that's where we, we ended up with all the beetle kill uh, across the country. Um, let's touch on some plants real quick. Um, we just went on a field trip, Ken, Amy, and I, and we came up with a, a new thing that we're gonna do here at Waters, and it's going to be the plant combo of the month. Um, so we went through and we picked out a select plants for the month that really highlight that particular month. So for October, which you'll be getting all this information, um, is the Autumn Blaze Maple, the uh, Virginia Creeper, the Red Wall, uh, the Mums, the, this is a really pretty combo. Are these beautiful or what? Um, Shrub-wise, we, we added the burning bush, uh, which is right there underneath the, the maple. Uh, the burning bush is a uh, deciduous shrub that stays green all winter long. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, that stays green all summer long. And then in the fall, it will be this red blaze of color. Uh, really pretty. Um, so we added that. 
the red rooster scent, which is the grass. It's fabulous. Uh, it gives you that really pretty fall color. Um, this is actually its color all, all around, um, but you can always tell um, it whether, I had someone ask, how do I know if it's dead or alive? <laughs> um, but it, it's gonna be supple, it, it's beautiful, it gives you a unique color to your yard, it can add dimension. Um, so it, it's a great grass and really drought tolerant, um, and especially for the fall time period. Time period. So that, that's our October combo of the month. Um, a lot of us want to add some evergreens, and I did mention that evergreens are usually one of those that don't flower. This is one of the few that actually does, uh, well, there's a couple of them up here that do. Um, this is a ballerina hawthorn, um, pink flowers, and this one actually blooms twice a year. So this will bloom in the spring and in the fall. Uh, gets in that three by three range, um, nice heavy leaf, so the wind and it doesn't tend to dry out on the edges. Um, pretty resistant as far as am animals go. Uh, so it's a great shrub to have in your yard if you want something green that, that does flower. And if I could mention the pubs grass yes. that's at the end there, it's blooms and all that silky frond that comes up. It happens usually in September. If you notice across our parking lot, near, just near the gates where you come in, they are just going like crazy. So the nice thing is that we talked about the early springtime flowering. So you have that after a while, it's done. And so to keep something going in the yard all the time, you know, you look at what's going to work. September, when a lot of other things in the garden are maybe starting to slow down a little bit, this is going to tell with these shoots that come up about this high, that silky, silky plumes, plumes, yes, the pompous grass. And it's evergreen right after the... Yeah. It is not an evergreen. It will uh, kind of dry out and die down. Uh, it's one of those that you'll need to cut back in the springtime. Um, one thing I will say with this is wear long sleeves, or you will have cuts all the way up and down your arm. Um, one nice way to prune this is to tie it up with the twine real tight, and then just take your saw to it, and then you won't have this big mess when you're done. Um, the other thing is, is that we always say once or twice a week, this is one that forgets this whole uh, rule. When you first plant this, you are going to water this every day, deeply. Um, these guys just suck it up until they really get established. So for the first two weeks or so, when you plant this, you're going to water daily. Um, once it's established, once or twi twice a week is fine. Um, it's just getting it started. There's a couple of plants in our, our nursery that need that. Uh, the potentia is another one that we water every day before it gets established. This is our uh, Sienna Sunset Heavenly Bamboo. Uh, this is also a nice plant um, that is an evergreen. Uh, it's fixing to turn colors with this orange and red. Uh, it's a really nice one for Christmas time because uh, it gives you that really pretty color. Uh, it is evergreen and so it keeps its leaves on every all, all year round. Uh, so it's a good plant. Pretty drought tolerant as well. Uh, so it's a great thing to add color and dimension to your yard. Um, it is called Heavenly Bamboo. It is not related to the Japanese uh, panda bear or bamboo. It will go all over the place, but really and, good plant. And it comes in kind of a small, medium, and large yeah. sizes as well. So you can do mix and match or pick out something that's appropriate to the space that you have for, for the growing. Um, this combo over here, sorry Doug, um, I just kind of threw it together to show you how you can mix annuals and uh, grasses, 
um, perennials and vegetables all in one pot uh, or an area or whatever. Um, your, some of your lettuces um, add, have this great color. Why not mix it in with the pot? You know, it, it makes a great texture, different colors. Um, the, the rainbow chard that I broke on the way up here uh, has really pretty great uh, stem color. So it adds color dimension to your, your pots. Uh, Dusty Miller is always great. Um, and then the Dianthus uh, gives you color. Um, Dianthus is an evergreen, so it will uh, survive the winter. Usually it'll stop blooming in the wintertime, but it'll pop back out in the springtime. Um, pansies are great all winter long. Uh, even with the two foot of snow last year, mine just, as soon as it melted, they were up and at them and nice and happy. So uh, there's a lot of planting we can do in the wintertime as well. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I have a burning question. Sure. Other than the warmth of the bed having as a butterfly bush, mm -hmm. do you prune that back? Uh, her question was, do you prune back the butterfly bush? Um, I think it kind of depends on how big you want it to be. Um, it's always nice to do a little shaping in the spring, or you're going to have this funky, wonky, uh, shrub that just kind of goes everywhere. Uh, so I always take mine down. Usually I, I keep mine at like four feet um, and just shape it up. Okay. Yeah. And one more question. What if you uh, really cut back the Russian sage? Is that like in October or frost or when? Or when they quit blooming? Yeah, so the question is about Russian sage and when you prune it. It actually could be any time, October, November, December, it doesn't really matter. I would usually wait till they're, they're done flowering and they kind of dry up. It makes it a little bit easier, they're a little brittle, more brittle. But uh, Russian sage, I, I attack mine with an electric catch cover, and I still do need attack because they get really big and leggy. And so it's, uh, I cut them back, they're mature plants, and I'm trying to take over the yard so that we. Do have some words about you know, whose yard it is. Also, <laughs> but, but once it's done flowering, uh, it's okay to go. And it's, they're, they're pretty hardy, so it's not like a rose that you need to be careful about early blooms or anything like that. Just, just one more question on the Russian sage. Does it take, could it be to take a lot of sun or in the shade? Russian sage grows in full sun. But it'll probably do well anywhere. You hear stories about people that. We have a lot that, of shade uh, right from our house. Yeah, I wouldn't grow it. It's probably not going to grow very well if, it's, if it doesn't get any sunshine. There are not too many plants that do. But Russian sage is a sun loving plant. Yeah, no question about that. Yes, what about the grasses? They, they seem to get it sounds like you just prune the top. But the, the base of them get more dense and more dense as time goes on. Do you need to do anything with that? Her question was about grasses, and uh, grasses tend to get dense in the center. Um, actually, if you go take a look inside our pampas grass, there's a hollow hole right in the center of it. And it's kind of what they do. Um, it kind of depends on how much you really want to, how much work you want to do. You can always divide it, uh, kind of one of those things like we do with the irises and such. Uh, you can divide it, split it, and then, uh, you know, we plant it. Um, or, I mean, the ours down there, it look great, and you, you really don't notice that unless it is cut to the ground. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Doug and I will be around if you have individual questions to ask. Um, we appreciate your time. And thank you for coming. Thank you.